This special 158th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg episode is brought to you by Mason Dixon Distillery. Delicious food, exquisite liquors, a welcoming and fun atmosphere, and that rarely found in Gettysburg on-site parking. Your next visit needs to include a meal or two at Mason Dixon Distillery. Mention you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg and receive a free dessert with your entree. Follow them on social media or just go to 331 East Water Street in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on your next trip. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, final 158th anniversary special episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Uh, Today, we are talking about July 4th and 5th, and we are doing it from a place that uh, is, uh, well, new to us. We usually go out on the battlefield, but Eric said, hey, how about we do it out at Saks Covered Bridge? And I was like, what a great idea. Mm -hmm. We can get out of the sun. And uh, there's a lovely breeze coming through here. And so if you you hear a little breeze rumbling, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're just going to have to live with it because it's 90,000 degrees today. Well, and and this breeze feels nice. And as everybody knows, Saks Bridge is one of the most haunted places in Gettysburg. And it's because three guys were hanged on the mysterious tree next to this bridge Yes, during the retreat. Yes, they were just... Hanged it's a known here. fact. Everybody, Everybody knows. knows that they were hanged there, and and we'll uh, well, well let's let's introduce our our guest and we'll ask him about that. Uh, Jim Pangburn. Hello, Jim. How are you? Hello, Matt. It's good to be with you. And I never heard that story. Hey, you, come on. Oh, so really? There's one person here that never. You've heard never heard wow. that story. Okay. Well, I man, I don't doubt it, but I just not no, I doubt story. It. It's it's not. It's not true. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's a, not. No. It's, <laughs> it's the foundation of a ghost. Yeah, story. Oh, it, it well, really there you is. Go. Okay, it's that's the, why. I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I've covered this ground quite a bit over the last six months, and it <laughs> seems that the first mention of anything like that happening was in a book that was published in '97 or '98. Oh. Yeah. Ah. So, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there we go. That's not true. Um, but we're talking about, not Saxbridge per se, but we're talking about uh, July 4th and 5th, which includes, of course, a lot of rain and retreat, the two R's. And, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who've been listening from the very beginning, especially patrons, because I didn't say this on the free episodes, but I always would start off with, uh, I'm learning, you're learning, so let's learn together. And this is uh, one of those episodes where it's very apropos because... Um, I don't really know a lot about the 4th and 5th. My interest has always stopped with the uh, the end of July 3rd and the end of the shooting. But uh, only recently have I started to become more interested in things that uh, predate the battle and uh, post-date the battle. And uh, so, so here, usually, you know, I'll ask the guide a, a question as we go through that uh, I already know the answer to. I'm kind of just leading you into giving the answer. But here, I mean, I kind of boned up a little bit beforehand, but not enough to really uh, have a full grasp. So Jim, this time, is going to kind of do it a little bit more uh, like a presentation, but we're going to interrupt him with questions. Um, and uh, Cam in the peanut gallery, if you have a question, you just, you know, raise your hand. And ask it, um, and we'll give you a microphone, okay? So, Jim, why don't you start us off, uh, I guess let's start at the end of uh, July 3rd. Is that all right? Just to set the stage. Sure. Uh, the the battle's over. Um, it's darkness. Darkness has fallen over the land. Um, what are the two commanders thinking at this point? Well, well Meade is, is thinking about possibly counterattacking uh, or making a reconnaissance and force on the Union left, uh, pushing forward to see exactly where the Confederates are um, and seeing if he's in condition maybe to uh, to follow up their uh, failed uh, attack with a picket's charge. Um, part of that was, you know, Farnsworth charge on the uh, Confederate left, right. and, you know, disaster. Um, Lee, will he realizes he's used all his offensive capabilities once picket's charge fails. So he takes all the troops that are in town along Middle Street, Ewell's Corps, and he moves them up onto Seminary Ridge and extends the Union line. So it's just one long line along Seminary Ridge all the way up almost to where the Peace Light Memorial is in Oak Hill today. So he clearly is in a defensive position, hoping that the Union Army will make the same mistake he's just made. Uh, so basically from the Mummersburg Road down to the Emmitsburg Road-ish. 
Yeah, and uh, well, all the way probably down to what they call Pinch Gut, where uh, Emmitsburg Road meets, uh, you know, what is uh, West Confederate Avenue, where it becomes South Confederate Avenue yeah. today. You yeah. know what I'm talking about, uh-huh. about the Snyder Farm Yeah, up there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so he's uh, pulled back. They start digging in, right, building breastworks and rifle pits and other things. Yeah, you know, um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but... Um, Directly across from that Millen Farm, mm-hmm. on West Confederate Avenue. Mm-hmm. Have you guys ever been back in that field? You yep. and me and Bob went back there one That's time. That's right. We did. Yeah, yeah, you can see the remnants of earthworks. A lot of people don't know that. So yeah. clearly that was a, a defensive situation. Well, what's interesting about that, I don't know if you remember uh, when we went out there and I we were standing in them and I said, why would they put them so far back? Because they're giving up the, the crest of the ridge by this point. Yeah. And... Um, I think one of you guys pointed out that, well, the Union troops would be silhouetted against the sky, so a little easier. But also, um, I was reading in Coddington today, and he says that uh, the reason for that was, you know, it would be more open ground for the uh, Union troops to go across under artillery fire. But then once they get up onto the ridge, getting into the woods, because those might have been wooded at that point, or at least they're as they are today at the at the tree line, basically, um, then they would have to deal with uh, Confederates or infantry that's behind breastworks. So it was to lure them in to just a, a wooded mess of a trap. That's what Coddington says. Lee clearly is hoping the Union Army will counterattack and they'll make the same mistake that he just made in yeah. attacking across those open fields. But now is Meade getting ready to do that? Well, I'll read you what he said. He, okay. Uh, uh, he, he refused to make that same mistake. You know, Lee waited over 24 hours. He waited until the night of the 4th of July before he withdrew. So he gave Meade an opportunity to attack. And Meade, uh, well, this is what Meade said, uh, explaining his reluctance to attack. In consequence of the bad example Lee had set me in ruining himself attacking a strong position. Uh, just been given you know, a firsthand demonstration of why you don't attack across a mile of open fields. Um, uh, so he learned a lesson. Somebody else's lesson, but he learned. I think both commanders learned a lesson from that, to be honest. (laughs) You know, that really showed, um, and we're we're kind of getting off top a little bit, but Pickett's charge really showed that uh, that, that the old mass Napoleonic infantry assault tactics has been outmoded by the new technology of the back rifle guns. And we just don't, you know, in Virginia, where they've been fighting for two years, the the farms are smaller, and you really don't see that much open ground. But here in Pennsylvania, you know, the it's almost a mile of open ground. It's the first time they really had a chance. You know, in the Napoleonic era, you know, Lee's men would have got well across that field against those smooth war Napoleons before he really took a lot of casualties. But here at Gettysburg, his men are taking it the moment they come out of that tree line a mile away with those new black rifles. Even guns. before they come out. Yeah. Some of them what do you are mean the bombardment it. prior yeah. to? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So uh, Meade's not going to do that. What condition is his army in, though? Well, that's something I wanted to talk about. Yes. Um, let's talk about that. It's it's bad condition. Um I was just reading something today. I think it was in uh, Kent Masterson's Brown, uh, Kent Masterson Brown's book, uh, Me to Gettysburg. And it said something like 14,000 of the Union horses were uh, incapacitated at the end of the battle. Mm. That something like six to eight times the number that were killed mm. were incapacitated. Uh, the men on this day that we're, that we're recording, June 29th, 158 years ago, Meade's men are moving up from Frederick. They're, moving, they're marching 30, 34 miles a day. Mm-hmm. And if they had shoes, they're being torn up. Right. So a lot of these guys had no shoes. Uh, I think it was around the 30th that Meade ordered the men to, to fix uh, uh, rations for three days. Well, guess when that runs out? <laughs> July 3rd. <laughs> right. So they don't have any food. Yeah. And they haven't slept much. Uh, I also read today, I think it said that 45% of the officer corps in the Union Army Potomac had been knocked out. Wow. From lieutenants up to generals. Really? 45%. Wow. So he's going to have to you know, reorganize the Army. And a lot of the leaders. units are, are dwindled down, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In some small. cases, you have captains running regiments. Yeah. Which should be you know, a colonel or right. a lieutenant colonel or a major. <laughs> yeah. you got a company commander running a regiment. That's the situation. Well, I mean, look at, look at the first and third corps. They they mm. never recover, yeah. yeah. And and they're they're rolled into the fifth and and what sixth corps. They never the really exist. Yeah, they they cease to exist the following yeah. spring because they've just, just they've not, been Gettysburg beaten up knocked so them out. Badly. Um, so okay, so so Lee uh, Meade's army is in pretty bad shape. Um, and you know you meant, mentioned Kent Masterson Brown's new book about Meade. I just started it, so I haven't gotten far. But I think I'm on like chapter three. Um, but, uh, so far I really like it, but, uh, recently, especially on, on our show, um, we, 
we've really been, especially with you, coming to the defense of Mead. You, you're a big fan of Mead. Absolutely. And I, I'm with you on this. I think he was a very good commander, especially here. And um, especially given that he was only in command for a few days before the battle started. <laughs> Three days. Yeah. And uh, all the stuff that he had to deal with. Right. So um, it seems to me that the, the people have always assumed that since they won, the Union Army was always in uh, just tip-top shape. And ready to go, running after Lee and doing whatever had to be done because, you know, they were the mighty invincible Army of the Potomac. But they were in some pretty rough shape themselves. It's just the opposite, Matt. Um, And uh, I was reading something today that said, you know, studying the art of war. uh, Meade had studied under uh, Dennis Mahan at uh, West Point, and he was a disciple of Clausewitz who said that uh, a lot of times after a battle, uh, the winning army is at least as bad shape as the losing army, um, you know, and the ammunition was pretty much shot. Um, so, yeah, Meade was really in bad shape. Um, a lot of people talk about the Confederates. You know, I was reading recently, it said, you know, the Confederates had set up when they arrived here. Uh, they'd set up hospitals in the rear, and they set up food stations. So they were actually able to feed their army, really, after the battle, better mm-hmm. than Meade was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now... Uh, so I read something uh, in Coddington today that um, I guess just never occurred to me before. Um, when when Lee, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but when Lee uh, begins the plans of going back into Virginia, uh, one of the first things he does is he sends word to Chambersburg to send all the supplies and everything down into Virginia. So it, just clear this up for me. Was... Were they just collecting things at Chambersburg the whole time they were up here, or were they sending things back all along, and that's just the remainder of them at I Chambersburg? I think the latter. Okay. Uh, I know they were sending stuff back, uh, like, days before the battle began. Yeah. They were over in Chambersburg on the side of the mountain, uh, sending all the stuff that they some collected as far up, you know, as Shippensburg and Carlisle. They were sending stuff down. Um, so it probably was, you know, whatever was left, or maybe, uh, most likely, that's what it was. You had, the, you had the wagons that were with the Army throughout. Um, and they're going down the Chambersburg Road, and they're going down into the mountain uh, to what we call Greenwood, mm-hmm. um, and then turning, not going to Chambersburg, but turning south uh, toward the villages of New Franklin and Guilford and um, Marion, Castle. which Marion is kind of between Chambersburg and Greencastle. Oh, Greencastle's okay. close to the line. Uh-huh. So when they get to Greencastle now, it's, it's almost directly a, a, a retreat south okay. uh, toward Williamsport and uh, Falling Waters, uh, H- Hagerstown. Williamsport, Falling Waters, the crossing sites. So, okay, so uh, we've established that Meade's army is in pretty bad shape. What's Lee's army in? They're not in great shape either, um, obviously, from the fighting and everything. Uh, but one of the, the big things that's going to hinder both armies is it's, it's raining. It's pouring down rain. And so these guys are, are marching in uh, you know, over mountains in very muddy, rainy conditions as thunderstorms going on. And... Um, and these aren't paved roads; these are dirt roads. Right. You know, it's 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 worse for the the wounded. You, you yeah. hear the stories of the guys in the wagons, and there's no springs, there's no hay, you know, to to uh, soften the the the, the, the jolts of you know, hitting yeah. the, like the roads you described. And I, I remember hearing stories of, of guys that are wounded and just begging people, just just take me out of the wagon, put me by the side of the road, let me die. Right. You know, and you know, a lot of guys. Uh, you know, who did die in the wagons and you know, were left by the side of the road and weren't even buried. They just had to keep moving, had to keep yeah. moving fast. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, he's he got to move. So, so the, I guess the difference would be that even though there's this torrential downpour that both armies have to deal with, Lee kind of has to move. He can't wait. Yeah. And Meade, it's not that he can wait, but he has to wait because he needs to get food up and supplies. Right. Well... When you get into July 4th, the two armies are facing each other. Meade's refusing to counterattack. Lee's waiting for him to counterattack. Uh-huh. Uh, it rains pretty much all day. That you know dampens the powder and everything. Doesn't do a lot of good for the ammunition. Um, Meade does not realize that Lee is gone. Lee really starts to pull out on the night of the 4th. He uses the cover of the thunderstorm and the darkness of night to cover the sounds and sights of his withdrawal. So Meade does not actually know for certain that he's gone until okay. the morning of the 5th. Right. By this time, Lee's already gotten a jump on the Union Army. Well, now Meade's got all these problems. He's got to bury the dead. 
notorious general. Okay, the army holds the fields of victor, but the downside of that is you got to bury the dead. Right. So Meade buries his own dead rapidly right where they fall. He doesn't have time to bury the Confederates. He employs local civilians to do that, um, and then he's got to collect arms on the battlefield, uh, reorganize the army, and rest the army. My yes. gosh, remember I said two days before the battle. This day, June 29th, these guys are marching 30, 34 miles to get here. Uh, then they go into battle for three days. What kind of shape do you think they're in? Exhausted. Exactly. You have to be. Right. And, and I don't uh, care if they had three days rations with them that are running out on the third. You're going through all of that stress on the body. You need more food. That's right. Yeah. I don't think people really get that. They don't. And, and, and you know, there's something else, Matt, and I, I ran into this the other day, and this is why I created this program about me pursuing the Confederates, because, you know, all these people say... Well, me got fired because he didn't pursue the Confederates after the battle. And you just you grab your forehead and you say, oh, my gosh, he did pursue them and he didn't get fired. He was at Appomattox. He's still the commander of the Army of the Right. right. But I, I think what happens, guys, I think somebody said this to me the other day, and the lady was, like, shocked when I told her it wasn't true. And all of a sudden I realized she's confusing George M. Meade with George M. McClellan, the previous commander of the Army Atomic, who failed to follow the uh, the Confederate Army after Antietam. And Lincoln actually had to come to the camp, you know, um, yes. outside the battlefield of Antietam near um, uh, Shepherdstown and, uh, you know, urge him to move. Right. He'd already fired him once uh, in 1862 after seven days fa- campaign, brought him back, fired him again, um, and then they replaced him with Burnside. So I think people get this impression that it's the same guy, and George Meade is not George McClellan. No. And he did pursue him, and he didn't yeah. get fired. Um, this is a, a telegram that Abraham Lincoln sent to the governor of New Jersey, oh. a guy named uh, Governor Parker, the day before the battle. Uh, it's time stamped 1055 a.m. from the executive mansion. And this really puts you into Lincoln's mindset before the battle. It's just a short sentence. I really think the attitude of the enemy's army in Pennsylvania presents us the best opportunity we have had since the war began. Mm. So what okay. Lincoln is saying is, okay, the Confederates are now out of Virginia. They're in Pennsylvania. This is our excellent opportunity to beat them uh, off of home soil. Uh, this is the best chance to end the war, not mm. just defeat them, but end the war. That's his mindset. So I think you need to think about that when you think about his interactions with Meade uh, after the battle. Right. Does he ever uh, express to Meade prior to the end of the battle that he wants him to bring about the end of the war and destroy Lee's army? He expressed to Meade that he was disappointed that Meade did not catch the Confederates and destroy them before they got back into Virginia over the Potomac River and that the war would go on. That's after the battle. After the battle. Yeah, after. Um, He actually wrote a letter. Um, and he was ready to send it, and he didn't. He put it in a desk, and he later told me about it, um, and he apologized. I think he, I think he said, uh, I was wrong in, in my uh, assessment of the situation at the time. Uh, but, see, the thing about what you need to think about Lincoln is, when you get to Gettysburg, is that he has been disappointed by the commander of the Army of the Potomac after every major battle in the mm-hmm. East. Let's start with McDowell at First McNassus in July of 1861. Then we go to McClellan, the seven days, he's within six miles of Richmond. Lee turns the tables on him, drives him back uh, to Harrison's Landing where he has to board boats and get the heck out. So they get rid of McClellan. They bring in um, uh, Pope, uh-huh. and uh, he's coming down from Washington. Lee turns, heads north. Uh, Jackson goes uh, completely around Stewart. Uh, uh, McClell- or, uh, Pope has to retreat. The Confederates are already back at Manassas. They're waiting for him. They force him to attack. It's a disaster. Second time in a year, the the Union Army is moving back into Washington. Uh, Then they bring back McClellan, and he manages a tactical draw at Antietam nine months before Gettysburg. But then he lets the Confederates go back across the river. Does this sound familiar? And get away. And then Lincoln has to come visit him and prod him, and he didn't didn't move. And so by November, then they bring in Burnside. Right. And then Burnside fails at Fredericksburg six months before Gettysburg in December 62. So then... January, late January 62, they bring in Hooker to replace Burnside. He tries the mud march, which fails. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, Burnside did the Burnside, mud march, yeah. and they replaced uh, uh, Burnside after the mud march with Hooker. But then Hooker did the uh, uh, Chancellor's Chancellorsville, Bill. you know, and actually looked like he had gotten in behind Lee and really put him in a bad spot. And once again, Lee turned Just, the tables on him. Yep. Um, so now you get rid of... Uh, Hooker, three days before the battle, now you got Meade. So Lincoln is really kind of expecting almost, I think, that he's going to be disappointed, that these generals are going to 
do something stupid. And I think he's worried about that with me, that maybe he's overly cautious. It's kind of like if you, if you date the same type of person over and over again, and they and you always find yourself being disappointed by them in the same way, and you just go, there you go again, there you go again. And then you finally get to one person who's good, mm-hmm. but you mistake something for the repeat of the mm-hmm. behavior you're used to. Yeah. And then you get all mad at them and you mm-hmm. have a big fight. And then you realize uh, you were misunderstanding because you're expecting that. Because of the past yeah. experiences. Yeah. Um, which have nothing to do with the present. Which have nothing to do with the present, right. It's a different person. And so Mead, okay. So, so Mead, uh, as he's you know getting his army in shape, though... Uh, is he is he sending anyone out after Lee? Yes, he is. Okay, and guess who it is? Um, what core hmm. would be the freshest core in the terms sixth. Of, of yes? The six, well, they're not real fresh when they arrive on July 2nd and having marched 34 miles right. in 18 hours. But now it's July 4th, actually the 5th. He okay. starts the pursuit on the 5th. And uh, the challenge for Meade was um, we have to make sure the Confederates are absolutely retreating. Okay, so we know they're heading towards South Mountain, all right? But are they going to turn around? and wait for me to come and attack them in South Mountain? Are they actually retreating over the mountain into the Cumberland Valley? Or are they going over the mountain and then plan, after Meade comes after him to recross this side of the mountain and now attack Washington, which is mm. uncovered because Meade has left Gettysburg and tried to follow him. So, so Meade he has still to be, has to worry about Washington. Right. It's still On the 5th, he actually sent some of his corps to his corps. I think it was the 11th and the 1st, as far south as Emmitsburg. But then he halts them. And he sends Sedgwick and the Sixth Corps after, out the Fairfield Road. And uh, Early's Div- Ewell's Corps is the uh, the uh, rear guard, and Early's Division is the rear division, and Gordon's Brigade is the uh, rear brigade. So Gordon's uh, Brigade is in the rear, and about two miles east of Fairfield, they turn. They set up artillery, and they turned on Sedgwick. And he gets the idea... Okay, you know, maybe they've got a strong force here. Maybe they want us to attack them in those mountains. Um, and the other thing was, uh, by the 6th, uh, Sedgwick, Sedgwick really doesn't know. He thinks that the Confederates are retreating, but he sees this strong rear guard. And so he sends a message back, hey, they're not completely retreating. And so Meade tells the guys that have already started moving south, hold it. We've got to be sure of what they're doing. By the 6th, there's been so much rain, there was fog. Huh. When Cedric moved forward, he, he couldn't really move forward because so much fog in the mountains, uh, he was very cautious to move after the Confederates. Um, so finally, they they get the impression that, that Gordon has pulled out and that they are the Confederates are indeed retreating over the mountain. And so now it's somewhat safe uh, for me to, um, uh, to begin to pursue the Confederates. But he decides not to go directly after him. And here's why. Uh, one, supplies. We talked about that. He needs supplies. Right. Where's the closest railhead with supplies? Westminster. Westminster, Maryland, 25 miles down the road. If you go toward the mountains after Lee, you're going away from those supplies. Right. Here's the second thing. If you're following Lee's wake, don't you think the Confederates are going to gather anything uh, of value in terms of foraging on that route? Sure. What's, what's going to be left for the Union Army? Nothing. Right. Um, and also the thing is, let's say you catch up to their rear guard and they slow you down in the mountains. Then the rest of Lee's army is unhindered on the way to the river. Uh-huh. So uh, me does what I thought was very intelligent. He said, all right, we're going to come up. We're going to leave Gettysburg the same way we came up. We're going to go south on this side of the, the Blue Ridge, uh-huh. the uh, South Mountain. Um, and we'll be moving closer to Frederick. Well, here's the thing. There's a rail line that runs from Westminster to Frederick. So, so the supplies can, supplies can be sent to yeah. Frederick. Right now you're moving towards Frederick. You're okay. moving to where your supplies are. At the same time, you stand pretty close to the Confederates along the mountains. Then at Frederick, you cross over, try to cut them off. And uh, and, and, and did, did he have to get like... Was, there, was he also waiting for a supply of shoes that he was going to get at Frederick? Yeah. Yeah. There's actually, I think I have a somewhere in here, I have a, a, a telegram that he mentioned around the 7th or the 8th that um, uh, shoes were going to arrive, Shoot, okay. like 2,000 shoes or something like that in Frederick okay. for the men. That just gives you some idea what condition they were in. <laughs> right. So, okay, but we're talking about the 4th and 5th. So, all right, so he starts moving towards Frederick. Right. Okay. He halted. The whole army, or is most of it going there, and then some um, of it's following Lee? By l- late on the 6th, the army is pretty much... Um, in movement south of here. Okay. Uh, some will head back toward two taverns toward Littlestown. Some will go down the Emmitsburg Road to Emmitsburg. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's another route that they took. If uh, they didn't, didn't think not too many went toward Westminster. Basically, we're going through uh, uh, Thurmont, Tawnytown, 
um, in that area. Okay. You're not too, going too far away from the enemy. Right, right. Um, okay. But, All right. So what What else? Uh, where do we go after that? So he's going down to Frederick. Lee's heading towards uh, the river. How, how, how long does it take Lee to get down there? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, Lee's lead elements, his, his uh, wagon train under uh, a guy named Harmon, uh, the wounded and the prisoners, mm-hmm. uh, they went out the Chambersburg Road. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, 17 mile column. Um, they began to arrive at uh, Williamsport uh, by the night of the 5th. Be- they leave first. Yeah. Right. They leave from like her ridge. That's where a lot of the wagons were parked. Right. And they're heading out over the mountains. And, you know, while the two armies are facing each other here in the 4th, they're well on their way. Um, on the other side of the mountains and down to Williamsport. Uh, but here's what Meade did on the 4th that was was pretty bright. Uh, he sent his cavalry after Lee. Uh, the army's still here, but the cavalry's going after him. Right. And uh, both Buford and Kilpatrick uh, kind of came in from Frederick and crossed the mountain, and it caught up to the Confederates just as they were arriving at Williamsport. And it was like cowboys and Indians. <laughs> And I say that because what happens is the, the, the Confederates took their supply wagons and, uh, you know, put them together like the Cowboys did, you know. Uh, circle the wagons. Start, circle the wagons. Yeah. Thank you. And then uh, Buford uh, attacked and Kilpatrick attacked. But uh, then the infantry started coming in. The Confederate infantry came in to support that. Uh, and they weren't able really to do anything more but withdraw, withdraw back toward uh, – uh, Boonesboro, Maryland, and then just kind of act as a as a screen for the Union infantry that would arrive later. So there's there's some skirmishing going on, or some fighting going on as yes. the retreat's happening. Yeah, you know, really the only fighting that goes on until the Confederates retreat over the Potomac River in the middle of July is with Union cavalry right. against Confederate retreating elements. Okay. I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but uh, on July 4th, Meade went south toward Little Round Top. And he went to check out the situation with the 5th and 6th Corps. And he asked them to um, uh, send a reconnaissance forward. And apparently the reconnaissance uh, under uh, McCandless's brigade, Pennsylvania Reserves. Yes, sir. Uh, Eric loves them. Um, they, according to uh, an article uh, that I've taken notes from, uh, they, they cleared the woods in their front, uh, passed over the wheat field and into the woods beyond, and they captured uh, 100 men of Benning's brigade in the process. Um, but the problem was that neither the 5th or 6th Corps, spread out as they were over the south end of the battlefield, were ready to make an effective counterattack. So they kind of move forward. They, it's kind of reconnaissance of force. You find out the Confederates have moved back, but they're still pretty much in strong force on the 4th. So it, it's really not feasible to attack. Once again, Meade's army isn't almost as bad a shape as Lee's army is, even though they won the battle. Yeah, because so you, you're making the point that the fifth and sixth corps are not uh, completely together, and they're all spread out, both of them, yeah. in the southern the battlefield. So they're not ready, really, to move forward offensively. And the fifth corps kind of, you know, had some fun on the the second, so they're not <laughs> completely intact either. Exactly, they were yeah. heavily involved. Yeah, um, yeah. Harry Fonts wrote uh, an article in Gettysburg Magazine. Uh, the issue was uh, number one in July 1980. Excuse me, July 1989. Um, and he said, Harry Fonts, we all know him, mm-hmm. second day at Gettysburg, Culp's Hill, East Cemetery Hill, first day at Gettysburg. Uh, he said that, that, that they just didn't have the time to get an attack organized on the southern end of the battlefield, uh, down on the Union left, down toward Little Round Top. So a lot of people say, well, why didn't Meade move forward down there? And, yeah. You know, and that's why. Right, right. Um, okay, so. Uh, well, go ahead. I guess you have more. Okay, how about this? Yeah. You know, we were talking about the, the challenges that faced Meade, like on the 5th, once he realized the, the Confederates were gone, but he couldn't move right away. Before they left the Gettysburg area, this is from Fonts again, the Union force, uh, as, as one, had buried a reported 3,000 Confederates. Jeez. So they buried their own dead and an additional 3,000 Confederates. So you see they kind of have their hands full. Yeah. It's not like they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs. <laughs> yeah, right. They're not like having a kegger. And this is kind of interesting. This is also from the same article that Fonts wrote. He said, to move away first from the field, the Union Army, would give the impression of a defeat, which, of course, was undesirable. Hmm. Remember, the army that holds the field is considered the victory. So that's, that's in his head, too. Um, this is... This is what Warren said. You want to hear what Warren said? Sure. He said, there was a tone among most of the prominent officers that we had quite saved the country for the time. 
and that we had done enough that we had that we might jeopardize all that we had done by trying to do too much. Well, well, that's this- fair. I mean, if you repulse Pickett's charge, but you attack Seminary Ridge, and you get beaten down on Seminary Ridge, just- do you still win that battle? Right. You just wiped away your gains. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. A member of the 14th Brooklyn said, most of the men were by this time nearly shoeless. Most of Most the men of were the nearly men. shoeless. In many cases, the men had not even as much as a sock for protection. As so, a member of the 14th Brooklyn said that. So, I mean, now, as somebody once said, and I don't know if they were exaggerating here, but, uh, you know, with all the thing about uh, shoes and Confederates looking for shoes and stuff like that, that the, the Union Army for footwear was actually worse off during the Gettysburg campaign than the Confederates. Because of what was happening in the days before the battle. They're they anxious to shoes. get up here, deal with Confederates on northern soil. They're marching up for Frederick. On June 29th, uh, they marched 30 to 30, some of the corps marched 30 to 34 miles. So they're going over creeks with rock bottoms. They're tearing up their leather shoes. And that's why these guys are in pretty bad shape as far as yeah. shoes go. Right. Even when they get to the battlefield. Right. So that's uh, so that's something to think about too. Is that the Union Army is like in, it just, and we'll probably keep saying this over and over again until it sinks in with y'all, that they're not in great shape. They're at least as in bad a shape as the Confederate Army is. How about this? Um, I talked about the rapid march that that Meade's men made on June 29th, um, cut, trying to come up here. Uh, I got a note here that says. Uh, with the loss of shoes and men to heat stroke and exertion, by nightfall, the army is lined up between Emmitsburg and New Windsor, Maryland. A hundred men died by the side of the road that day. A hundred men died during that. the march. So that gives you some idea how much they're pushing. Wow. And that's before the battle. Yeah. So I'm, what we're trying to convey here is that it, it, this is before the battle, and then they go into a three-day battles. So you imagine the shape they're in after the battle. Right. There's not any rest when they, they yeah. get up here, they pitch in the battle, and... <laughs> So just so you know, they're not really fresh and ready to go after the yeah, they Right, they're not coming in fresh. They didn't. They didn't come here mounted in minivans, <laughs> well fed on McDonald's and KFC. Oh yeah. God! I, yeah, talk about it, diarrhea. It's, it's rough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Yeah, that 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 is uh, something. It's it's easy to fool yourself into thinking that because they won, they were in top, you know, tip top shape, but they weren't. Not even close. No. You know, another thing that they they had to do on July 5th, besides burying the dead, collecting the arms off the field, assess supplies and the condition of the troops, rest, organize, they had to learn the position Mm. of of, of what the Confederates were doing. So this is what, you know, Sedgwick is doing on the way. So he's on the move, checking out what the Confederate rear guard is doing. Meanwhile, these guys are kind of resting. And then things really get underway as far as pursuit on July 6th. Is it a slow pursuit? Well, it... It is. I mean, some of the guys are marching like 10 miles, 11 miles like to Emmitsburg. But the problem is the conditions, mm. not just the shoes, but it's raining heavily. The roads. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, but uh, almost throughout the Gettysburg campaign, it rained almost every day, except like the, the first or second day here in the battle. Right. Um, so, and then I don't know if you guys have ever done this before, but I've done this. Uh, go down Route 15 between here and, and Frederick. And then turn right on those roads and go oh, yeah. into this. Have you done it, Eric? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's the um, way I go to you, Antietam most of the time. Uh, it's just like up there where the Frederick Reservoir is. It's just gravel roads and wooded areas. Mm. And I've seen it in good weather. I mean, you try to imagine a torrent of rain coming down and the, the roads are just quagmires. You don't have any shoes. Uh, so they got to go across that mountain. Yeah. You know, at this point, by July 6th, most of Lee's army is on the other side of the mountain. They're collecting toward the river. Of course, the river's flooded, so they have to start entrenching. Well, the Union army is just now going over the mountain. Right. And uh, all the horses, um, a lot of the artillery horses had been knocked out, and Meade was sending messages back to Washington. Uh, Pleasanton, the cavalry commander, was sending messages back. For goodness sakes, send us horses. Um, they didn't have, heart, the artillery had lost a great deal of the horses as well. Yeah. And they're trying to go over a mountain in rain. Right. Right. And, and so the uh, walking on these unfinished dirt roads uh, in the rain just turns that into a quagmire. Exactly. Right. Deep mud. Deep mud. Deep mud. Yeah, it, it doesn't pack it down. It churns it up, and it uh, makes it very hard to get through. So I would imagine that getting those the, the wagons and the artillery and everything through there is going to have uh, it's going to present some problems for you. It's going to slow you down. But is he also cautiously moving forward? 
because no. You know, no, so he's not like no. Okay. Uh, here, here's a message, a brief message that Meade sent uh, to Halleck, uh, you know, who's the general in chief in Washington. So right. Halleck is between Meade and and, and and Lincoln, and he said he sent a message at 6 p.m. on July uh, 5th. My army is all in motion. By July 5th, late uh, 6 p.m. in the evening, my army is all in motion. Um, and then, you know, in Washington, they weren't real sure uh, exactly what was going on with the Union Army. They were hearing that the Confederates were passing wounded over in small boats and prisoners and stuff like that. So they got the idea that Meade was just kind of letting them go uh, across the river. Um, God, there is a... There's a quote here that I have here that relates to the impatience of what's going on uh, in Washington and Meade's response to that. I'd like to find that here somewhere. Uh, I found it. (laughs) Uh, This is actually on July 8th. And, you know, it it took time. You send a message, it might take 12 hours to get to Washington. Things have changed by then. But uh, July 8th, uh, Henry Halleck, General-in-Chief in Washington, sends a telegram to Meade. The president is urgent and anxious that your army should move against Lee by forced marches. And this is what Meade answers. My army is and has been making forced marches, shorter rations, and barefooted. (laughs) I think this really captures what's going on. Sure. They're in Washington. They've got one perception thing. They're not there to see what's going on. Right, right. Much like we are today, 158 years later, looking back and not considering these small things. And this is why before the show started, I was telling you about environmental history of the civil war. Um, and I always tell listeners about it whenever, you know, anybody who will listen, you got to get it because it makes you realize that history really kind of moves and changes on small things, Mm -hmm. not big grandiose plans, but tiny things. They will either make it happen or hold it back. And you know, things like shoes, Oh, I love to go barefoot in the summer. Well, yeah, you're going barefoot in the summer on the beach. You know, <laughs> like try going barefoot in the summer on rocky roads, on dirt, on like that, that, that carrying 30 pounds of equipment. Yeah. Right. Wild yeah. grass carrying equipment. Um, try that and try doing that every day for weeks and then tell me how much you like going barefoot what, in the what, summer. What's the old, uh, what's the old saying? Is it, uh, Amateur study tactics, professionals study logistics. Yeah. Eric, I'm glad you brought that up because um, uh, I have a colleague who's a retired uh, Special Forces colonel. Mm -hmm. His name is Kevin Covenhauer. Oh, yeah. And I've learned a lot from him. One of the things... uh, You you know, you keep bringing him up and uh, we need to have him on the show. Maybe you do. Yeah. Maybe you do. You always bring him up. You'd be sure to tell him that I was the one. (laughs) 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 But um, he used to say, you know, if you really want to understand armies and movements, you you got to understand logistics. A lot of people are like, logistics are boring. (laughs) It is. um, You know, logistics are the things we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, Ammunition, supplies, marching conditions, uh, roads. Do you have roads for supply? Do you have roads for retreat? Um, you know, you really can't fully understand what's going on until you understand the logistics. It's everything. It really is. It really, it yeah. really is everything. And I remember when I when I first started reading about this stuff that yeah, Eric, like you said, it's boring. Oh, it is. Who it's wants to read boring. about that stuff? But without it, you don't have these battles. You can't put these armies in a, in the field. No. You've got to have the logistics. And I remember I used to think when I would read about a, a general saying, oh, we don't have enough ammo or we don't have enough this or enough that. And I was always like, oh, what a crybaby. But, you know, that was 16 year old me. But now I'm like, I'm glad you said that, actually. Sure. You're but, welcome. You know, when I was younger, it, it 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 always baffled me that the Union Army didn't adopt a repeating rifle. They existed. Right. Right. I, the, the federal government bought something like 15,000 Spencer rifles mm-hmm. and 150,000 Spencer carbines. Mm-hmm. So why not make it a standard infantry weapon? Well, it didn't occur to me until, you know, a few years ago. You have to carry that ammunition. Right. Mm-hmm. So if guys are burning through ammunition, mm-hmm. yeah, how do you keep them resupplied? Uh-huh. You can't just airdrop a couple of crates of... Uh, <laughs> From Spencer, a, from Spencer a hot cartridges. Air balloon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not you, you've, you've got to have mules pulling wagons, yeah. and guys have to carry it on them. And you're going to need more of them because they're going to go through more ammunition. Absolutely. So it would be a bigger nightmare. So anyways. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. All right, so go ahead. Um, You know, we're on this talking about, you know, the difference between what Meade is experiencing and what Washington is perceiving. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I read a couple of telegrams? Please read all you'd like, Jim. Okay, thank you. General Orders Number 68 uh, from the headquarters of the Army of Potomac. 
four fifteen in the afternoon, July fourth. Okay, the priv- the privations and fatigue the army has endured. Our task is not yet accomplished, and the commanding general looks to the Army for greater efforts to drive from our soil every vestige of the presence of the invader by Commander General Meade, Seth Williams, Assistant Adjutant General. And that, that, those words, to drive from our soil every vestige of the presence of the invader, uh, is going to get Meade in, uh, uh, in trouble with Lincoln, because two days later, at 7 p.m., uh, from the soldier's home in Washington, Lincoln sends a telegraph to Halleck, the commander of all, all forces, and he says, I left the telegraph office a good deal dissatisfied. You know I did not like the phrase in orders number 68, I believe, drive the invaders from our soil. You know, And he said, all, when are they going to realize all of it is our yeah. soil, that all Meade wants to do is get them off our soil, he's not not pursuing them, doesn't, doesn't understand we need to destroy them before they get off our soul, or this war is going to continue. But I think that's the confusion of the war that we struggle with to this day, is this idea of, uh, you know, it's all our soil, or get them off our soil, or you're invading our country, or whatever. Um, people today, I think, still have a hard time. You know, I, I, I've there was an argument on Facebook not too long ago um, about Confederate monuments and someone made a point, uh, you know, uh, let's not forget that they are still talking about the Confederates. They're still Americans. And uh, Eric and I were reading it and we said the hell they were. They didn't want to be part of this country for four years and they fought to get away from it. And it's just, it's a complicated thing. Lincoln is like, no, they're all Americans. They're just throwing a fit right now. So this is all our soil, but it's just, you know, wait, just got to get it all back together again. And then, you know, you got guys in the army saying we drove them from our soil and they're, that's kind of acknowledging, yeah, they're a separate country. It's confusing it, it's to the very people strange, then and to the people now. Yeah. It's a very strange position that the country was in at that time. Yeah. It's very contradictory it's hard to fight yourself sure yeah. <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> but that's what's so fascinating about learning this stuff is like really studying it is it's it's a and i think that is part of the reason why people are so fascinated with the civil war is the insanity of it like it's hard to grasp and so we we study it to try to understand it better but i don't know if we ever feel like we come close to totally understanding it on a human level, not not factually, you know. Yeah, and you, you, I mean, you look at today, you know, and I'm watching TV in the morning, and the news is on, and you know, you got people there saying that you know, if Trump doesn't come back in August, there's going to be another civil war in August. Yeah, supposedly he's coming back. Coming back where? To the presence. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have gone through that door, but uh, well, no, but I mean, I that's mean, what people are saying. Yeah, I, and so I'm just saying we're. We, <laughs> Some of the same things going on. We're all Americans, but we have these vastly different views. That, yes, yes, and I think every culture has to go through these things every eighty or so, every eight, eighty to hundred years or something like that. Um, you know, where you, it's, they're growing pains, and you got to kind of, you know. But yeah, it is it is strange. It, it's all very strange. But anyway, um, where do we leave off with uh, the post battle well, stuff? If you don't mind, here's another telegraph. I think is telling. Now this is Halleck. Sending a message to Meade. Now, Meade has sent his message about what he's doing, uh-huh. how he prepares to, to pursue the Confederates. It's July 5th, so he really hasn't pulled out of Gettysburg yet. And this is what Halleck sends to Meade. Your movements are perfectly satisfactory. Your call for reinforcements to Frederick has been anticipated. Call to you all of Couch's force. That's the uh, militia that's up in Harrisburg. They're coming down to uh, aid uh, Meade. So at this point, uh, July 5th, uh, you know, Halleck is saying, hey, you know, you're doing pretty well. Um, and everybody, you know, these days is saying, well, he just sat there. Well, apparently Halleck felt like he had a reason <laughs> to sit there and he understood what he was doing. Sure. Now, you, know, you say call to you, uh, Couch. Um, is he telling me to call Couch to him or is Halleck He's sending? Telling, yes. To yeah. send forces from Harrisburg to join the army. Okay. To add to his army. Is he also sending reinforcements up from somewhere else to Frederick? Like, uh, like actual army? They, they kind of yo yoed with that. There were guys at Harpers Ferry. Yeah. And they were blocking the pass there, and they're up on Maryland Heights. And at one point, when they thought the Confederates were retreating, they, they were ordered, uh, General French, who took over the Third Corps, was ordered to go and reoccupy 
uh, uh, Maryland Heights. You see, they'd actually told French at some point during the battle to evacuate it and bring his army to, to Frederick to, if, if necessary, to support Meade's army. And then when they realized that the Confederates uh, were indeed retreating, not thinking about coming back, then, then they countermounted uh, the order to French uh, to occupy Maryland Heights. And it was, yeah, so it's kind of confusing things going back and forth based on the situation at the time. Okay. So but yeah, I, he I was like being supplemented. Uh, Meade was receiving refreshment. Uh, reinforcement. Re- he was not. <laughs> refreshments, yeah. So well, you can tell what I'm thinking pot. here in this hot weather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff I've already, I've already mentioned. Um, uh, Sixth Corps sent a brigade, Neal's Brigade, to follow uh, the Confederates of the mountains. And then they brought the Sixth Corps south to Emmitsburg. And then they joined the retreat the same way the rest of the Army was. Um, by July 6th, Longstreet's Corps had reached Hagerstown. Ewell had arrived at Waynesboro uh, near the border. Um, and you've got cavalry fighting in Hagerstown. The Union cavalry's there. The Un- Union infantry's not there yet. Uh, by July 7th, all but Meade's... By July 7th now, guys, all but two of Meade's seven infantry corps are either at Middletown, which is between... It's kind of a t- between the Potomac River, the Confederates are, and Frederick. It's west of Frederick. It's west... It's east of the mountains. Um, and all but two of the Corps are either at Middletown or in the Catoctin, Catoctin Mountains by 11 p.m. on July 7th after marching 15 to 20 miles, you asked me earlier about that, yeah. on muddy roads in heavy rain. Uh, <laughs> many of Meade's men are missing shoes. Meade arrives in Frederick on the night of the 7th. Um, if I can add this, Matt, I always thought this was cool. This really, this really hit home for me. Meade's the commander. You know, they get all the perks. He writes a letter to his wife, and he said, since I took command on 28th of June, to now, the 8th of July, uh, I haven't, I said, I've hardly eaten anything but broken crackers, um, hardly had a decent night's sleep, haven't changed my clothes in 10 days. This is the commander of the army. So when you see the condition he's in at Frederick on July 7th, you get an idea of what the men must be like, too. Sure. Um, here's what he said also he, he wrote to his wife. On July 7th from Frederick, he said, we shall have another battle before Lee can cross the river. For my part, as I have to follow and fight him, I'd rather do it at once and in Maryland than to follow into Virginia. Okay. Now, was there a plan to get down into Virginia via another crossing and stop Lee from crossing back into Virginia that way? There was there was some thought, um, and I think they sent a unit... Uh, the cavalry had gone through the passes like down toward Harpers Ferry. Yeah. And they'd actually uh, cut some of the bridges that Lee had even before uh, the battle ended. The pontoon bridges. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons Lee couldn't get over when the, when the river was flooded. He had to, you know, uh, find wood, build bridges, you know, and all that time he's entrenching and the Union Army's still approaching. Um, that they, has to be scary. <laughs> yeah. They don't really that's start it. to arrive. And when I say arrive, I don't mean the whole army. Yeah, I mean, like the leading infantry elements don't even start to arrive opposite Lincoln until like the 8th of July. And the other units are going to have to come in. So it's it's probably close to the 10th of July before the whole Union Army is ready opposite Lee and ready to attack. OK. All right. It sounds like it's it sounds like a, a very. Almost like it's tougher for Meade. It's a tougher job before him after the battle than the battle itself. Because, I mean, you know, the battle, you know, you're sitting in your position. Once you get your position, you're in your position and you're going to hold it. Not that it's guaranteed that you're going to hold it, but you're you're going to try to hold it. You know, you, you, everything's a lot closer at hand. But now you're on the move and you're in pursuit of an army on the move. And, you know, there's the, it's like a chess game. Like you got to kind of figure, you got to try to anticipate where he's going to go. And, and get your men to be in the right position. But at the same time, you have to let those who are able-bodied recover from the battle that they just went through by eating and getting shoes and all that stuff. Well, see, you just touched on something really, really good there, Matt. Thank you. Um, so why doesn't Meade cross the mountain passes south of Lee and cut him off? If he does that, then Lee can recross the mountains in Baltimore, Washington, which Meade, I didn't mention at the beginning, but at the beginning when he took command on June 28th, you know, he was ordered to do two things. Confederates out in Pennsylvania in the open. This is your best chance. Go out and defeat them. Oh, by the way, always keep your army between Baltimore and Washington. Right. So when you said it's a chess match, it's exactly right. 
Um, if Lee moves over the mountains, uh, you know, what can I do? Do I move toward him or do I stay closer to my supplies? Do I move south? But do I move south before he moves? What if I move south and he recrosses the mountains and then Water Washington is, is open? Right. So a lot of what was going on with Meade on the 5th and the 6th was simply trying to get information. Right. What is Lee doing? Where is he? And then I'll make my decision. It's the same thing before the battle. He was desperately trying to get information. We'd heard that Early was over at York, but Longstreet's over at Chambersburg. What is that? 50 miles? Maybe more than that? Yeah, from, something from like York. that. Yeah. Oh, York is 28 from Gettysburg. Gettysburg's 26 right from Chambersburg. Almost 60 miles. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're not really sure where the main main body is. You're trying right. to figure out where do I, you know, if you look at where Meade camped the night before the battle at northeast of Littlestown on the Tawny Town Road, the Tawny Town Road, outside Tawny Town on the Littlestown Road. Mm-hmm. What, you know what direction that is? That's toward York. If you're moving toward Littlestown, mm-hmm. you're moving northeast. Okay. So he's he's acting on the latest information he got of Yule and Early in York. So he's thinking everything's going to be over by yeah. York. Yeah. And then all of a sudden Reynolds is telling him, you know, and Buford is saying, hey, we got a pretty strong force over here on the left end. Right. And he has to change. Start shifting the army over to the left. Yeah. So it's the same thing, Matt. It's a lot it's of... It's not... Uh, yeah. Yeah. But at, at least at that point, they're a little fresher. Well... Not totally, but a little fresher than they are going to be after July 3rd. Yeah. I guess they do have to be a little fresher before the battle yeah. than after the battle. So I'll grant you that. Yeah. I mean, it's... From when you read of them, when they're talking about marching north, it seems like they're, they're in a little, little better shape. Spirit wise, and you know, well, now that's the thing because yeah, the morale, yeah, you know, you're moving into Pennsylvania, you're going to liberate northern soil. I think it had a lot to do with how the battle turned out. I mean, for once, they're fighting on home soil, right? It's one thing to fight a bunch of battles in Virginia, keep losing them, war just goes on, yeah. But you come up here, lose could be, could be the end. And these guys are inspired. Well, you remember what Meade said on June 30th, he sent a cir- circular out to all the commanders. This is in the movie, um, speak to your men about the issues of the oncoming battle. Address them in terms of firesides and mm-hmm. home and you know family and stuff like that. Inspire them. I and you see Chamberlain in the movie. Remember he does that? Yes. So on his uh, hill, hillside speech there that he gives. Yeah, and then he and then he issues the order, and commanders have the authority <laughs> to uh, execute any any man they feel like <laughs> <laughs> who fails to do his duty or something. Right, like that. that's what he was. Yeah. Fails in the execution of his duties. That or is something. critical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you, you can't, it can't all be nice. No. Well, that'll inspire you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My that'll get me moving. Me. Absolutely. All right. So, um, uh, so I guess but even though we, we're saying this is about July 4th and 5th, you might as well just go all the way to, to the end of the all campaign right. when Lee gets back into Virginia. Um, here's a message uh, to General Meade from Halleck. Uh, Halleck says this was sent on July 7th. So now Meade has just arrived in Frederick. The Union Army is... Uh, really crossing the mountain, and they're, they're, and within the next 48 hours, we're going to come to grips with the Confederates. Very close. Halleck says to me, I have received the, from the president the following note, which I respectfully communicate. Major General Halleck, we have certain information that Vicksburg surrendered to General Grant on the 4th of July. Now, if General Meade can complete his work so gloriously prosecuted thus far by the literal or substantial destruction of Lee's army, the rebellion will be over. Yours truly, Abraham Lincoln. He's getting excited. He's got, give it He's got his hopes. Yeah, it does. Because <laughs> it could have ended. But it, it couldn't have ended. Well, Lincoln thinks that. <laughs> yeah. But this, the situation, the reality is, if he'd been here, uh, I think he would have realized that Meade's doing everything he possibly sure. can under the circumstances. Yeah. And I think we certainly realize that after... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I like that Meade is, is starting to get his uh, his due after all this time. Funny you should say that. Oh. Ready for another telegram? Yeah. Okay. This ties in with what you're saying. 3 p.m. July 7th, and it's sent from uh, Halleck to Meade. It gives me great pleasure to inform you that you have been appointed a Brigadier General in the regular Army to rank from July 3rd, the date of your brilliant victory at Gettysburg. Oh. So... You know, they're pretty pleased with the victory here. And Alex, you know, is saying, you know, we're pleased so far with what you're doing. It's it's Lincoln that's got the negative view. And for the reasons that we talked about sure. before, he's predisposed to think, oh, you know, we didn't talk about something else that's poisoning at least Lincoln's mind. And that's Daniel Sickles. Edgar Sickles. Right. Sickles had moved 10,000 men three-quarter mile to the front to the Peach Orchard, 600 yards from the Confederate line. 
uh, essentially destroyed his corps, 4,200 casualties out of 10,000 men. He's wounded on the second day, has the leg amputated on the third. Did you know Sickles was in Washington on July 5th? Yep. July 5th, Lincoln comes to his bedside for a report of the Battle of Gettysburg. And does Sickles tell Lincoln, well, I uh, took a corps of yours and against orders four times General Meade ordered me to occupy a little round top on the left, and I just blew those orders off, and I marched out toward the Confederates. Uh, but Meade didn't want to fight the battle here. He yeah. was preparing to leave, and so only by marching out toward the Confederates did I lure them to an attack and keep Meade there. And so Lincoln's going, oh, my gosh, here we go again. Yeah, the guy yeah. doesn't want to fight, and it's all nonsense. Yeah. Uh, it's all, you know, well, that's a good point. Like, his mind is being poisoned by sickles. And it's going to take a while. Very early on. Right. Yeah. And it's going to take a while for the true story to get to Lincoln. Remember, he wrote that note criticizing uh, Meade and telling him that, you know, you, you may have blown the one chance we had to end the war right here. But he fortunately put it in a, in a, ca- in a, um, a drawer Yeah, and then waited until he got the full story. We should all take a, a lesson from that with, with yeah. our emails and our comments and things and, you know. Just write it and then don't send it. That's what I do. I actually do that sometimes. That's like I'll write something. I'll, I'll be as frank and blunt and honest as I want. If someone you know says something that's just kind of got my, my dander up, if you will, and then I will delete it. I remember you telling me that story a little yeah. while ago. Yeah. And you said, Eric, right here, read the story. Said, Matt, you can't send that. And you had yes. Eric write a more and diplomatic note <laughs> with all the points that you wanted to make. Exactly. Is this what we're talking that, well, about? No. I mean, well, yes and no. It, it, it is, but uh, that was a specific example of it. But I've been doing that since. I don't know, years ago, I just started doing that. When I, when I get, whenever it was that I first heard the story about Lincoln's letter, I said, well, you know what? That might be a good idea because he was wrong. Yep. And maybe once in a while, and this is very infrequently, but once in a while, I might be wrong. So, Or you just don't have all the information. Correct. You know, Correct. You're, you're basing your opinion on what you're getting, but there's something you don't know. Yeah. And, and I might be right, but the anger that I might be feeling might color my words in a way that will make things worse. So, you know, I, I, I don't send it all the time. If I save it, I look at it the next day and then go, yeah, all right, this is good to send. Or I say, no, I'm not going to send that. And I write it in a nicer way. But anyway, that's beside the point. But it, it, Lincoln, Lincoln was a smart guy for the, doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Lincoln handled people very well. Uh, his cabinet, which was trying to backstab him, um, and he knew how to manipulate, I don't mean manipulate, but turn people who were kind of working against him uh, and turn their actions and yeah, it's political smart. things to his favor. Yeah. He was, he was a smarter guy. I mean, that's what that book, Team of Rivals, is all about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, July 9th. Okay, July 9th. Okay. The Army of the Potomac has crossed South Mountain completely. They're now on the same side of the mountain as the Confederates. And they take up a line from Roarsville. Do you guys know where Roarsville is? <laughs> Roarsville is between Boonesboro okay. and kind of like Harper's Ferry. Okay. Um, yeah. It's uh, to the east of South Mountain, but it's to the west of the Catoctin Mountains. Okay. In between the two mountain ranges. Yes. It's just south of Boonesboro. Uh, moving on roads that remain quagmires. You seeing a theme mm-hmm. here? Army still suffers from a, a scarcity of fresh troops, exhaustion, inadequate resources, and a lack of adequate rations. Uh, two corps marched without artillery. Because the horses had broken down completely. Two core. Halleck informs Meade. I love it when it ties into what we were just talking about. <laughs> Halleck sends this to Meade. Our information here is not always correct. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yes. So, it, Thanks, Eric. I, mean, I like that. I appreciate it. Um, okay, guys. So now the Union Army is opposite the Confederates at the Potomac River. And now Halleck is concerned about a rash attack by the Union on Lee's entrenchments oh. at the river. And he cautioned me from Washington on July 10th. He said, postpone a general battle until you can concentrate all your forces and get up your reserves and reinforcements. Beware of partial combats. That's July 10th. Beware of partial, partial combats. combats. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So Meade maneuvered closer to Lee's defenses, uh, but made very little uh, geographic progress. Um, Edwin Coddington, the author of the book you have there, The Gettysburg Campaign, said that Meade advanced cautiously, perhaps too much so for fearing of being surprised in a premature engagement, which could have unfortunate results. Mm. So, you know, it's easy to say, hindsight, you know, you should have just attacked, should have just attacked, but you're not there on the scene. 
And isn't that kind of just basically what happened to Lee during the Battle of Gettysburg? He wasn't purposely getting into a battle. Right. And look how that turned out for him. Yep. So, yeah. In the first day. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's won the first day tactically, but he's a little bit cautious about pursuing the Confederates to the town. The Yankees. Thank you. The Yankees. <laughs> They're the northern side, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it, Matt. 21 years of this, and I'll figure out who's on what. You'll get it. You'll get it, Jim. <laughs> Just keep trying. Like, give me a break, man. It's like 95 I know. degrees. <laughs> I know. But that breeze is lovely. <laughs> um, guys, by the 12th of July, uh, Meade is kind of rec- reconnoitering the uh, Confederate position. Uh, and he sends a message to Halleck, and it says, it is my intention to attack tomorrow. So that'd be the 13th, unless something intervenes to prevent it. Mm. Uh, most of his army is now concentrated in the enemy's front, the Confederate front. But rain, here's another theme, right? Rain, rain. late in the day, frustrated his plans for an attack. Hmm. When Meade solicited his lieutenant's advice at a council of his corps commanders that night, that would be the night of the 13th, five of his six corps commanders unqualifiedly opposed uh, assaulting Lee's entrenched position uh, along the Potomac. On the 13th, he spent the day surveying the enemy's positions. Well, guys, it was on the night of the 13th that the Potomac finally subsided, mm. and Lee was able to start moving guys over the river. And then the next day, the 14th, is when Meade moves forward, and Lee is pretty much pulled out. And the Gettysburg campaign is essentially over at this point. Um, oh, this is what Lincoln said when he heard about the Confederate escape across the river. He sent this, to mes- uh, this message Lincoln did to Meade. He said uh, he thought Meade's demeanor toward Lee reminded Lincoln of an old woman trying to shoo her geese across the street, across the creek. (laughs) And then he said later, we had them in our grasp. We had only to stretch forth our hands and they were ours and nothing I could say or do could make the army move. He's going back to McClellan. Yeah. And he's not on the scene. No, this is not George McClellan. This is George Meade. Yeah. When Lee gets across the river, does Meade go across after him, or where where does Meade go after that? He doesn't try to follow uh, follow right on his tail like he did refuse to do it in the mountains. Um, he went south uh, to Harper's Ferry, and he crossed um, at a town in Maryland along the Potomac River east of Harper's Ferry called Berlin, um, and I think a town called. Uh, Knoxville, some, Knox, Knoxville, something like that. Okay. So he's now crossing into the northern part of Virginia to the east of Lee's army. At this point, he's given up. So this is to still remain between Lee and Washington? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. He remembered his orders. And now the two armies essentially will fall back to their positions before Gettysburg. Right. Um, the Confederates, you know, near Culpeper, Virginia, and uh, the Union army kind of moving down uh, in the direction toward Fredericksburg. Um, back to uh, the the fourth and fifth, when when the uh, Confederates evacuate the town, um, is there any fighting in the town of Gettysburg? Yeah, no. going back to the fourth. No, Lee has completely pulled his forces out by the night of the third out of town. Uh-huh. No more Confederate forces. They're all up on Seminary Ridge, running from about Oak Hill all the way down to uh, uh, probably opposite the Round Tops and Devils. Right. But so there's no skirmishing or anything in town? No. Or? On the 4th, Meade put his army, uh, they kind of reconnoitered through the town. Right. And that's when they realized, hey, there's nobody in town. Okay. The Confederates have pulled out. So. I'm not aware of any kind of action at all on the 4th in the town. Okay. <laughs> guys, guys are like two heavyweight <laughs> fighters who've just gone 15 rounds. And the last thing they want. <laughs> it's a big fight. <laughs> Let's just, uh, you know, make a decision on who won the fight. <laughs> right, right. So probably, maybe, if anything, just a couple of pot shots here and there. Yeah, yeah, perhaps, you know, no, from Seminary like Ridge. Major, to, nothing major. No, okay. Nothing, nothing all right. at all. All right. Uh, okay, so then Lee's back over into Virginia. Me, Meade pursues uh, a little further east of him. Well, uh, in the fall, um, okay. Lee will detach part of his army, I think Longstreet's Corps, Longstreet. to go down to Tennessee. They tried to capture um, Knoxville. Um, and he does uh, send A.P. Hill around the Union Army toward Washington and uh, the Union Army, I think Warren was one of the major commanders, retreated toward Washington, and they ended up having a fight at a place called Bristow Station, I believe it was in October uh-huh. of 63, and it was a disaster for the Confederates. And so after that, Lee doesn't try really anything more uh, offensively. Um, he just pretty much holds his position near Fredericksburg, 
But um, then Grant came west uh, from the west, east, the following March, and he's put in command. Uh, he, he replaces Halleck. He becomes the general in chief. But um, he chooses not to sit in Washington in the War Department and issue telegraphs. And uh, he wants to act as a buffer between Meade and Washington. Mm. And so he chooses to travel with Meade's Army of Potomac, but he outranks Meade. And he essentially assumes command. command of the Army And it's not just the Army of the Potomac now. They've added other uh, Union elements in the Army of the Potomac. What's left of it? Right. Just the 2nd, 5th, and 6th Corps. That's all that's left after Gettysburg. 1st mm. and 3rd Corps fish guys out to other corps to replace their losses. They essentially cease to exist. The, the 11th, 11th and 12th? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you're going to say they, they combine. Yeah. And they become the 20th Corps to go out to the Western Theater. Yeah. So when you get to the Overland Campaign in the spring down in Virginia, where Grant starts to move around Lee toward Richmond, um, you only have three corps of the Army of the Potomac that's making up that army. And there are other ele- elements that they've added to it, though. But think about that. Only three of the seven corps yeah. that fought at Gettysburg are with the Army of the Potomac the following spring. That tells you something about how chewed up they are. <laughs> yeah. How about in the Confederate Army? What what happens to the units there? Um, Longstreet forces will be brought back to the Army of the Potomac because uh, Army of Northern Grants- Virginia. Thank you. Army <laughs> of Northern Virginia. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Longstreet's corps brought back, uh, and they're all pretty much consolidated now, um, all three corps still with Lee. But he he can't replace the losses that he took at Gettysburg. That's Meade my can. next question. Does he ever? Does Lee ever reinforce his army to the strength they were at before, when they no. came in here? No. 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 So this is the... Is 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 the Gettysburg campaign the largest Lee's army ever will be? No. Okay. Um, both armies actually... Well... Okay, on the southern side, I think so. Uh, it was twice the size it was at Antietam nine months before. Right. But the Union Army uh, had more troops, I think, down at um, Chancellorsville. But the thing is, they weren't it, uh, involved in the battle. They were there. They were there. But here at Gettysburg, almost everybody who's here at Gettysburg gets involved in the battles at some point. Yeah. With some exceptions in the Sixth Corps. Right. So this is the strongest Lee's Army is. And one of the things I tell people on tours... You know, giving them a lot of information. I say, okay, yeah, I understand that. We can overwhelm you. But if there's just two things that you want to remember about Gettysburg, that our park superintendent would want me to emphasize to you, it's that this is the biggest battle, and it's a major turning point. Because the Confederates do not recover from this, and the Union Army essentially can eventually. Right. And and uh, uh, it, it's uh, when, when Longstreet is down at Chickamauga, or what would be... The Battle of Chickamauga, um, September sixty-three. Yep. What what is are the, are the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia just kind of staring at each other, or are there any more offensive or not offensives, but major battles for the rest of eighteen sixty-three in Virginia? Nothing much happens until Grant comes east. Okay, and Grant's the aggressive one. And so many of these Union generals in the Army of the Potomac have fought a battle, even won it, and then retreated and licked their wounds. Yeah, and the war just goes on. So, you know, the longer you prolong the war, the better. But Grant, this is what Lincoln said about Grant when he came east. He said he understands the, the, the arithmetic. Because they said, oh, Grant, you know, he's a drinker. I said, well, I, I, I can't afford not to, to have him because he understands the arithmetic. What's that mean? It means that Grant understood that the Union Army would win a war of attrition. Mm-hmm. So Grant immediately starts offensives, not just with the Army of the Potomac. He sends Sherman uh, south from uh, Nashville toward Atlanta. Uh, he sends, uh, uh, was it Siegel? Yeah, Franz Siegel, and then later um, David Hunter through the Shenandoah Valley while Grant himself is going through eastern Virginia and he, all these different choke points to, to strangle the Confederacy. And um, these are these are all as coordinated as they can be with all the diff- distance yep. between them. He's trying to choke the Confederacy to death. Um, is, and, that, is that the first time that all of the armies in the field are pushing towards the same general goal when when Grant comes over or like uh prior to prior to Grant were they all kind of operating in their own theaters as Yeah, I would say they kind of were Matt um uh Winfield Scott, the old Mexican war commander. Yeah. Um he is actually the general in chief at the beginning of the war, but he's pretty old. So he'll get replaced uh I think by McClellan at one point. Um he starts the Anaconda Plan, Anaconda Plan, Anaconda Plan at the beginning of the war. And that is they completely surround the South with blockades around the, the, the coast, and they just try to squeeze the Confederates. Uh, now, up to this point in the war, you have these sort of half-hearted you know, forward movements, but aren't real consequential, except for Grant in the Western Theater. 
you know, he, at Fort Donelson, he cuts off Cumberland, Tennessee rivers, you know, pushes the Confederates all the way back to Chattanooga. And then late, he goes to Washington, and then Sherman comes in, and then Sherman starts to make the march from Chattanooga um, and uh, Nashville down through Georgia, the march to the sea. Uh, but so far, a lot of this stuff has been inconsequential. Um, some gains in West Virginia, some gains in Virginia, but for the most part, Lee controls most of Virginia. The yeah. Union Army has the uh, coastal areas, Fort Monroe and Hampton, uh, which where they launched the uh, seven days uh, the Peninsula Campaign mm-hmm. uh, against mm-hmm. uh, Joseph Johnston before Lee took over in the uh, spring of 62. 62, yeah. All right. Um, peanut Gallery, you guys have any questions? Jeff, I see you over there. Uh, no questions for you? I was late. You, you got here late, so you missed it. How about you, Cameron? No. No? Oh, Nothing. wow. How about you, Eric? You got any questions you want to ask uh, Jim before we end here? Yeah, who actually used Saks Bridge for the retreat? Oh, oh since we're here. Oh, man. It's mostly Longstreet's cores. I was just going to say, I thought it was Hood. Yeah. Okay. And maybe McClaws. Okay. And it kind of makes sense because they're the ones down here in the south end, so yeah. they're closer. Yeah. Whereas uh, Hill retreats out to Fairfield Road. Yeah. Uh, Longstreet's Corps, yeah, they're down here. Hill pulls out first, Yule pulls out after him and, and forms the rear guard. So these guys are going to kind of eventually make it up to the Fairfield Road. So what, what, what road was this? I mean, I guess what I don't it, know. It, it still is, but I mean, the. the 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 bridge came over here, went out there, and then it, now it ties into uh, Pumping Station Road right. or the Millerstown Road. Um, but was this originally the Millerstown Road? Do you know, Eric? I've always thought that it was, but I, I could be completely wrong about that. So what we know, uh, going with your theory then, what we know is the Millerstown Road over there. Um, it's the modern. It's the modern. Incarnation. Of yeah. It. That's what I've always understood, but I I might be wrong. I don't know. Okay. I don't even know. Well, that's okay. We're, it's okay to say I don't know Good. here uh, because none of us do. So, Cam, you know, know you nothing. have an idea? Um, I say from back home. I say from back home and dealing with all kind of old roads, this might have been at one time one of the old roads for the area. Just the name of it. I wouldn't Just, know. Right. Maybe a connecting road? Yeah. Maybe oh, yeah, it uh, could be. the uh, circle side it would be the best. Place. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, somebody knows the answer for sure. But, I mean, maybe that's what it is. It's a connecting road to the Millerstown Road. I don't know. We'll have to look that up. I'm sure um, it's an easy answer. You know, people are listening right now yelling at us saying, it's the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know. You know, since uh, we've been on the roads, I know when I was at Shepherd, we always argued about which way was the quickest to get up here on a... At, our dining hall, a bunch of us, like 10 of us, all Civil War his, or history buffs. To get to Gettysburg from Shepherdtown? Yeah. Mm. So I've traveled you didn't a lot. You did a lot of dating back then, did you? <laughs> <laughs> you got to bring up my dating history No, no, I'm again. just saying. You and your friends, not just you. <laughs> we would be at D Hall. We'd be what we call D Hall on Shepherd Campus. Probably one of the biggest hot topics was... Which way is the quickest to Gettysburg? I can remember going up over uh, Kentucky Mountain. I can remember one time we even raced up the different back roads to see which way is the quickest. <laughs> did you run? No, I, had, I, I did in my truck. I drove in my truck. Okay. All right. Well, hey, listen, college is for all that wild stuff, right? <laughs> That's what you do in college. Um, all right, Jim, thank you very much for uh, doing this. You're welcome. You want, can you I add some, Yeah, you want to add? Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to wrap it up if I could. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to read a letter or a note that Oliver Otis Howard, 11th Corps commander, sent to Abraham Lincoln on July 18th, like okay. four days after the uh, Confederates got across the river and the Union Army is now uh, at Berlin, uh, the Potomac River crossing over into Maryland. Mm-hmm. And this is what he says to Lincoln, Oliver Otis Howard, as to not attacking the enemy prior to leaving his stronghold beyond the Antietam, it is by no means certain that the repulse of Gettysburg might not have been turned upon us. At any rate, the commanding general was in favor of an immediate attack, but with the evident difficulties in our way, the uncertainty of a success, and the strong conviction of our best military minds against the risk, I must say that I think the general acted wisely. Oh, there you go. Um, a guy named A. Wilson Green, he used to be with the uh, Association of Preservation Civil War Sites, which is now the Civil War Trust. 
uh, wrote the, ba- this. the American Battlefield the American Trust. Battlefield yeah. Trust. Yeah. Now. yeah, it used to be known as APCWS, I believe it was. Right. Uh, he wrote. He wrote an article. Um, uh, Meade's Pursuit of Lee and Gary Gallagher's book, The Third Day at Gettysburg and Beyond. This is what he said. Mm. General Orders Number 68. Remember, yep. remove them from every vestige of our soil. General Orders Number 68 helped. That's Herman Hopped, the railroad guy who told Meade he ought to attack immediately and then went to Washington and said, Meade's not doing anything. <laughs> and an exaggerated impression of Lee's vincibility prejudiced the president's perception of Meade's pursuit. In his own defense... Meade responded to Lincoln's criticisms in a letter to Halleck on July 30th, okay, at the end of the month. The president labors under two misapprehensions. First, I did not fail to attack Lee at Williamsport because I could not do so safely. I simply delayed the attack until, by examination of his position, I could do so with some reasonable degree of probability that the attack would be successful. He, Lee, withdrew before that information could be attained. Secondly, my army at this moment is about equal in strength to what it was at Williamsport. I'm not sure what he means by that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, so Lee, uh, or so Meade eventually is going to kind of speak up for himself there with his uh, bosses. That's good. And I think finally people started to to realize, you know, what had happened. But I, I do think the the confusion with McClellan leads a lot of people to come here and think, oh, yeah, this was the guy that failed to pursue and that uh, was uh, cashiered, was relieved of command. And just so we make it clear, Meade uh, absolutely pursued to the best of his ability, uh, was very aggressive, uh, leading right up to the battle. And um, he did pursue, and he was at uh, Appomattox. Oh, can I end with something that's kind of cool? Yeah, yeah. So Grant and Lee meet uh, at Appomattox, and Lee decides to surrender. And after that decision was made, and before, that was April 9th, and then they had the surrender ceremony on April 12th. Well, Meade asked for permission to go to see Lee in his camp, and he got permission to do it. So they met, and they talked, and both of them had been in the Mexican War, and they talked about that experience. And um, Meade says to Lee, I don't remember you being quite so gray. And Lee looks at Meade and says, you have to answer for that. Yes. <laughs> and that is from Robert E. Lee, and I think that's a pretty good source. And I think that's a great place to leave that there about George Meade's uh, conduct here at uh, Gettysburg. Um, real quick, before we go, um, let's see. Yesterday, the 28th, we hit 200 patrons. And uh, by... The time we started recording this, the last I looked, we had 203. Oh, wow. So I want to thank all of you guys. And this is uh, from the heart here. Um, you're, you know, I've had big dreams my whole life. And uh, in a small way, this podcast is a small version of, of those dreams. And you guys are helping make it come true. And, and I appreciate it very much. I... Um, Honest, to be honest, I don't know what you like about our show, but I'm glad you do. <laughs> I, I really am. And, um, uh, you know, by the time this airs, who knows, we might be down to 150. But at least now we are at 203. Uh, we thank you very much. We hope that you continue to stick with us. And even people who are no longer patrons, who were patrons for a while and then canceled it or whatever, um, you helped us through those times that you were aboard, and so we thank you. We hold no grudges because you're no longer a patron, um, and we hope to see you come back at some point. But uh, that's it. I just want to say a big thank you to you all, and uh, we hope you enjoyed these anniversary episodes. want to thank our sponsors, uh, Getty's Bike Tours, uh, TR Historical, Mason Dixon Distillery, and uh, our T-shirt shop, of course which is uh, wonderful. Uh, And uh, that's about it, folks. Uh, We will see you next month. Have a good one. Our hearts so stout have got a stain for soon to see from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's all drink down and pay the landing on the nail. No man forget shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's all drink down and pay the landing on the nail. No man forget shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory.